Hi, it's Dave. This past weekend, Starlink engineers did a Ask Me Anything on Reddit, and they shared a bunch of details on how the Starlink beta is rolling out. In this video, I'm going to be going through the highlights and see what new things we can learn about Starlink. This past week, I went to Joshua Tree National Park and I brought my Starlink Beta satellite dish as well as my HughesNet satellite dish. And because Starlink right now is geofenced, I wasn't able to use Starlink at a national park. So I had to set up HughesNet, but it was such a pain. It took me probably like an hour to use and I used up almost my entire monthly data cap of 10 gigabytes just in one day. I personally can't wait until I can use Starlink on the road, especially in my RV travels to national parks. All right, so let's go to the first question that was asked at this Reddit AMA. It says, my question is regarding mobile usage. There's a lot of speculation as to whether the current hardware could handle a mobile platform. So the answer is from Starlink engineers. They said that right now we can only deliver a service at the address you sign up with at starlink.com. So in other words, it's geo-locked or geo -fence. You can't travel with Starlink at this moment. Um, it says mobility options, including moving your Starlink to different service addresses or places that don't even have addresses. This is coming once we are able to increase our coverage by launching more satellites and rolling out new software. So this is great news for all the people who are waiting for Starlink to use in mobile applications, like whether you're in a boat or whether you're in an RV or just traveling in different places. Starlink will offer this type of service just as long as they can launch more satellites and release new software to support this mobile coverage. All right, this next question is about power consumption. It says, the dish seems to consume about 100 watts at this point, which is pretty great for normal use. However, on small to medium sailboats, has a lot of power to be used. Any plans to build out a more efficient system in the future? I was actually having the same question because in an RV, to run Starlink right for many hours at 100 watts, that's actually going to take up a lot of batteries. So the answer from Starlink engineer says, we have a couple items in progress to further reduce power consumption. We are working on software and network updates to allow your Starlink to go into deeper power savings mode to drop power consumption while still remaining connected to the network. Power reductions are a key item we are focusing on in the future. So this is great news again. Like Starlink um, engineers are already aware that they're trying to reduce power consumption. This will allow people to use Starlink more um, efficiently in especially mobile situations. All right, the next question is about production costs and it says, how are the efforts to bring down Dishi's production costs going? Can you tell us how much it costs to manufacture? So one of the key constraints are challenges that Starlink has is to bring down the costs of the hardware. And so the answer from Starlink engineer says it's going well. And this is no doubt one of the hardest challenges we're tackling and there are always ways to improve. And then they give some information on how to contact Starlink, right? If you want to join their team. All right, the next question is about cold weather. And the question says, I just ordered my kit. Um, you guys are life changers. I live in Canada and the winters can hit negative 45 degrees Celsius. Whoa, do I need to worry about the dish at those temperatures? And the answer from Starlink Engineer says, wow, that's cold. While we've performed life leader testing down to these cold temperatures with no issues, the dish is certified to operate from minus 30 degrees Celsius to positive right 40 degrees Celsius so it's a wide range and it looks like you know Starlink can handle the cold weather all right another question about cold weather it says could you settle the debate whether the dish has a heater and the engineers from Starlink says yes it does have self-heating capabilities to deal with a variety of weather conditions in fact we'll be deploying a software update in a few weeks to upgrade our snow melting ability with continued improvements planned for the months ahead all right the next question is about data caps and it says top of my list data caps yes or no hard limit or fuzzy limit the question and the answer from Starlink engineer says at this time the Starlink beta service does not have data caps so right now right you can use unlimited data but it seems like right these engineers at Starlink are leaving it open to instituting or implementing a data cap where perhaps you do have a data cap in terms of how much you can download or use but I'm not sure if this has been decided and who knows maybe there'll be an unlimited data cap like tier as well all right, the next question is on wide release um, ETA. So the question is, do you know what, what the target date for a fully open, non-invite based release is? And the answer from Starlink Engineer says, steadily increasing network access over time to bring in as many people as possible. Notably, we're planning to move from a limited beta to a wider beta in late January. So that's great. And this should give more users an opportunity to participate. So if you're waiting to get into our Starlink beta in the next few months, um, yeah, they're going to open up beta. And I think perhaps one of the constraints is actually making the phased array antenna the dish. And as they build that capacity, they can open up right, more invites for beta users. 
All right, here's a few questions on latency. The first question says, how do you think the speeds we're currently seeing from beta users will hold up once Starlink goes public and a lot more people are subscribed? All right, the answer from Starlink Engineer says, this is not going to be like your regular satellite internet where it gets way too crowded. As we launch more satellites over the over time, the network will get increasingly great, not increasingly worse. So it seems like the Starlink engineers are very confident that they can actually improve and increase right, the latency and the speeds that people are getting in beta. The next question about latency is as follows. It says, do you have a target latency that you would like to hit in the future? What is the time frame when this goal would be met? And the answer from Starlink Engineer says, we challenge ourselves every day to push Starlink to the fundamental limitations of physics. Current Starlink satellites operate at 550 kilometers, where light travel time is 1.8 milliseconds to Earth. The round trip from your house to a gaming server and back is at, be is at best four times 1.8 milliseconds at these altitudes, or under eight milliseconds. However, there are many obstacles that get in the way of achieving those latencies. For example, number one, when satellites are not directly overhead, your data must travel through the air for more time. Number two, small levels of packet buffering are helpful for stable service but hate, hurt latency. And number three, Starlink traffic travels through fiber on the ground. This is an indirect pathway that is 1.5 times slower than photons in vacuum. We will continually fight to provide the best latency possible, especially to provide a stable and reactive experience for gamers. So it actually looks like one of the target markets is gamers who are looking for super fast latency. All right, the next latency question says, any updates about space lasers? How much better can latency be with them? How much better can transcontinental connections be with them? When will the real world testing begin. And the answer says the speed of light is faster in vacuum than in fiber. So the space lasers have exciting potential for low latency links. They will allow us to serve users where the satellites can't see a terrestrial gateway antenna, for example, over the ocean and in regions badly connected with fiber or by fiber. We did have an exciting flight test earlier this year with prototype space lasers on two Starlink satellites that managed to transmit gigabytes of data. But bringing down the cost of these space lasers and producing a lot of them fast is really a hard problem that the team is still working on. So it looks like they've got uh, quite a way to go for these space lasers to work well. All right, the next question is about wind. And it says, what wind speeds is the dish tolerant of? And then it says, could you mount it on the tail of a flatbed trailer flying down the interstate into a collapsing thunder? storm. All right, the answer says, we definitely don't recommend that you mount it on your flatbed and fly down the interstate in a storm. The dish was not designed for tropical storms, tornadoes, etc. For high wind events, it's always a safer option to bring the dish inside if you have any concerns. All right, here's another question. It says, what's the most misunderstood part of Starlink? And the engineers reply and they say that we have it all figured out. We are super excited about the initial response and future potential of Starlink, but we still have a ton to learn. And then they give some information if anyone wants to join their team. There's just so many moving parts and difficulties in establishing like a Starlink internet constellation. You have the satellites, you have the ground stations, you have the terminals, you have to make everything work. I can imagine like every day with the Starlink team, there are probably dozens and dozens of problems that they're trying to solve and they're doing a fantastic job so far. All right, here's a question about obstructions. And it says, hey, if we have a one to 2% right obstruction, there could be some dropouts. And so the answer says, hey, we're working on some software features that are gonna make this much better. Long-term, the clearance you'll need is going to shrink as the constellation grows. So this will get better. So in other words, as there's more satellites circling and orbiting the Earth, there'll be less chance that obstructions will really matter because you'll have more satellites to get you data. The next question is about locating satellites. And it says, I'm super curious how the Starlink terminal locates the satellites. And the answer says, Starlink actually has no knowledge of the satellites when it powers on. The constellation is updating all the time, so this would be difficult to keep up to date. The Starlink is able to electronically scan the sky in a matter of milliseconds and lock into the satellite overhead, even though it's traveling 17,500 miles per hour overhead. When it detects a satellite, the Starlink hones in on its possession and makes a request to join the internet. After that, the dish is able to download a schedule of which satellites to talk to next. And with that, it can point right at the satellites when the time comes. All right, here's the last question. It's an interesting one about creativity. It says, what part of the project invited the most creativity from Starlink engineers? And the answer from the engineers says, creating Starlink has come with tons of exciting challenges, but top few that come to mind. Number one, selecting full phased array for the satellite and dish. It was a major leap of faith, faith to start down this very technically challenging path and hope that we could arrive at an affordable and scalable implementation. So yeah, this is a super challenging problem to bring down the cost right, of a phased array um, dish, but I think, um, yeah, it looks like SpaceX is on the right track. All right, number two says, creating a truly plug and play experience for customers. We've spent a lot of effort and have gone through tons and tons of creative ideas on how to make this as simple of an experience as possible, including mounting solutions, automated 
pointing of the dish and general unboxing. Any and all ideas are welcome. Yeah, I've set up um, my own Starlink right beta unit um, a few times, and it's actually super simple. You just stick it on a mount, and you open up the app, and the satellite does its own thing, right? You don't really have to do anything. It's really automated. And I think the team has done a great job in making it as simple as possible. Number three, we've also had to be creative in how we operate what is now the world's largest satellite constellation. We have a very small operations team, so automated orbit guidance and collision avoidance was a must-have feature. We tell satellites what their final orbit slot is, and they figure out how to get there. For collision avoidance, we upload data on close approaches to relevant satellites multiple times a day, and the satellites then calculate on their own when and how to dodge something if necessary. It's interesting that they note that they actually have a very small operations team. I think this is very typical of Elon Musk's ventures. He takes kind of a relatively small group of people and gives them a super ambitious project where they have to use creativity and ingenuity to come up with these really interesting solutions to solve big problems. And one of these problems is how to keep right these satellites from running into other satellites or other things in low Earth orbit. All right, overall, I think it was a fantastic Q&A that Starlink engineers did over at Reddit. They shared some of the challenges they faced in this ambitious project, but they also showed a lot of confidence in rolling out this um, satellite internet constellation called Starlink. Personally, I wish they would have released some more details like timelines on exactly when mobile usage would be kind of in effect, but also when they can expect more of a wider release uh, right to general public. There are also some other questions at hand, like is the price going to stay at $99 per month for service? Are there going to be data caps eventually in the future? And when will they expand to other geographies and other countries in the future? Overall, I think a lot of the progress of Starlink depends on how fast SpaceX is going to launch their new Starlink satellites. They launch about 60 satellites at a time. And according to my estimates, around springtime or so, they'll have probably about 1,440 satellites, which is their first kind of stage where they can actually get some decent global coverage. And the next thing that SpaceX needs to do is they need to ramp up production of their phased array antenna dish. And they're going to do that as fast as they can and roll it out. And they also need to work out all of the bugs, right, and try to make the system more efficient and just better overall. But in general, I think Starlink is on a fantastic path forward. They are determined and they are focused, right, on getting this internet constellation to work. And they're doing something that a lot of people thought that was impossible for SpaceX to do just several years ago. All right, I hope this video is helpful. If it is, please like it and consider subscribing to my channel. I've done several Starlink videos on my channel, including a deep dive, and I'll link to that in the video description. Consider subscribing to keep updated for more Starlink videos and other investing videos. On my channel, we're looking at investment topics from different angles. We're really trying to get beneath the surface of things, not trying to just accept the traditional or the conventional view. I think that's the essence of investing in some ways. You're trying to find unrealized value. In other words, you're trying to find something super valuable that other people just haven't realized its value yet. All my videos are also available as an audio podcast. Just search for Dave Leon Investing at your favorite podcast app. And I'm also on Twitter where I'm active and I'm really engaging with the community there as well. You can follow me at HeyDave7. All right, hope you have a great day and we'll see you in my next video. Thanks.